Good people, what's up, what's good? Thank you all again for tapping into another edition of our Millennial Masterclass series. Blessed be your host, Caleb Smith of the Three Million Podcast. Today's conversation was a conversation that was beyond needed. It was with Ms. Chris Smith, AKA the Black Techie. She was great. She talked about her experiences in the Black tech space, corporate America, and how she's leaving her footprint and a path for us to follow when it comes to technology. Just learning from a black woman who's innovative, who is literally being a trailblazer right now. It was such a dope experience. Shout out to Chris, she's amazing. Before we even get this started, make sure to follow her on all social media platforms at The Black Techie, support her business, support everything that she's doing. We talked about entrepreneurship as well. It was a great conversation. And even these companies as well who may not be speaking up and doing it in a right way when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement and some companies who are. And she's breaking down how we need to be in those rooms and also how we need to create our own rooms and our own tables. This was much, much needed. Make sure to hit that post notification bell. Make sure to subscribe and to like this video, to comment and tell us your favorite part about this conversation and share this with at least two to three friends. We appreciate you all again. Now let's get to the fun part. Let's get this conversation started. Let's get it. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate you uh, coming on this evening. I appreciate it. Well, it's definitely. I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you for that. Let's start there. <laughs> anytime, anytime, anytime. Starting off from seeing your page, it was so dope, you know, seeing you talk about technology and seeing a black woman in the tech space. So how did you even get involved when it comes to tech? Well, fun fact, um, I actually was a probation officer, which a lot of people don't know, oh, wow. before I got into tech. Um, I'm originally born and raised from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. So for me, um, you know, have a lot of family members, like two aunts. One is a retired judge, one is still a judge. Wow. And I just thought being in the criminal justice space that I could be able to change the world, you know, just be kind of this super saver ho, like as far as like saving everybody yeah and, you know i was still doing a lot you know and i really loved all of my kids i dealt with all males um and wow. i always told them miss smith is just as true as you are so please <laughs> know i will lock you up no questions asked right I love but um i've always been passionate about technology since childhood uh, my mom who's a retired um teacher one summer she brought home this apple computer and i'm an 80s baby like i was born in 82. <laughs> So this is like the brown box, like the old school. Old man. school, yeah. The floppy, <laughs> when you had the floppy yeah. disk. And for me, I was very, very intrigued about it. And it just, it did something to me. Yeah. Um, and just from that moment, like I was enamored and obsessed. And fast forward years later, when I decided that, you know, the psychology space wasn't really for me, cause it was just <laughs> draining. I was like, you know, tech was always there for me. So I was like, what can I do now? And in 2010, I took the leap and I started and decided to apply for Apple. And wow. that was like trying to get into Harvard on the radio yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the and They put you through a lot of interviews and finally I got the position and I was with them for a few years. And that really started my tech journey like officially Mm. um in 2010 so that's actually like true story like i had quit my state job wow. um i had told my mom and friends at the time i was like i'm over this like i'm over it so let me just go ahead take some time really sit and i remember having a conversation with both of my parents separately and i was like i just want to do something like i want to do and so mm. my mom was like go figure it out my dad was more so like well, do something in tech. You're good with that stuff. So, you know, um, and that's really how it kind of got really started for real for real. That's how my journey really started in tech. I love that. Your story actually hits home for me because my dad, he was a, a probation officer for like 20 years. So mm -hmm. it actually hits home. But yeah, it was a lot of work for him. So I get it. Absolutely. I get it. So backtracking back to 2010, you took that leap of faith. Uh, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for other Black women who want to get involved in tech and they just might be afraid? Um, honestly, I will say there is no better time like the present. Um, mm -hmm. I know that sounds very, very non cliche like, yeah. but when you look at not only the pandemic, when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement currently, 
the tech space, if you can see, is still functioning. Mm. There are still plenty of opportunities to learn how to code um, if that is your route in tech. And I have to explain that because everybody just thinks that technology is, you know, at the end of the day, just the end all be all. You got to be a programmer or engineer. There's yeah. so many facets in tech. You can be in sales. You can be in business development. You can be in marketing. You can be in policy and law. Like there's so many areas, but there is no better time like the present to really take and capture this moment. So if you are, and you know, I'm 38, I'll be, you know, 40 in two years. So for me, it's just like, you know, if you're in that millennium stage and even to the zillennials that are watching this, if you feel like that this is your pivot to purpose moment, Mm. Go with that opportunity. Look at people that you can connect with, like myself and like a Kimberly Bryant, who I am enamored. She's the founder and CEO of Black Girls Code. And look at an Angela Benton. Like Angela is doing amazing things in the analytics space. And there's so many other women. There's a Jewel Burke Solomon who works for Amazon. Jewel is amazing too. Like there's so many, so many people. Well, thank you, girl. Come on to this melanin. Shout out yeah. to Oh, no. Hey, still young, young, still young. I am 38. <laughs> still young. Still yeah, young. exactly. But look <laughs> at black women like that. And even I wouldn't even say for the women, like, look at their journeys. Look at how they started. And, like, some of us didn't start, honestly, out in tech, like myself. Some did. And that is no disrespect or shade to anybody's journey. But what is most important is that you take that leap of faith. If you feel like right now you could be of service in the tech space, start having conversations, start really connecting with people on social media or even virtually offline. Like if you're on Twitter, like you can follow a hashtag. There's a huge group, Black Tech Twitter. Um, the great founder of it is Paris Athena. She's an amazing woman. Um, and you know, she's been very, very instrumental about black, more black people getting into tech, follow the hashtag, you know, black tech Twitter, start looking at the events and the organizations you're becoming a part of. Like, are you connecting with the right folks that are wanting to pivot to? There's so many opportunities, but it's all about taking that leap of faith and really having that heart centered moment with yourself. Like yeah. is what I'm doing, you know, for popularity or mm -hmm. is what I want to do a pivoting to a purpose moment? And I think when we have more conversations with ourselves like that, that we can really get to where we need to get to. And if that is the lane and you're a black woman that's looking to get into tech, I am always available. Like my DMs are open as long as y'all slide appropriately. <laughs> my, my number is like, you know, in my bio, like I am really like telling people at any point in time, I am open to having conversations because it's always been a huge mission um, and vision and purpose of my platform to make sure that I can help a lot more Blacks get in tech, but especially Black women because I am one, you know? Mm -hmm. So that would be yeah. my sincere advice for Black women who want to get into tech. I love that. And see, what you do right now is so innovative and so cool because I think that most of us don't realize how many dope Black women are involved in the tech space. And like mm -hmm. my girlfriend, uh, for instance, she's gone above and beyond in tech and she just found I'm a passion in that just like a few months ago and like video editing, all that. And she never knew about it because in school, like especially when it comes to black women, they are encouraged to get involved with computers and mm -hmm. cameras, technology. Um, so just seeing what you're doing is a major inspiration. So Appreciate how that. can we just cultivate a better uh, community of showing like, hey, like people like you and so many others aren't alone. Like how can we do you know a better job of I would say with our upcoming generation of, you know, encouraging them to get involved in tech. So here's what would be my challenge to the leaders, because it starts with us. Um, I think that we need to be open to being a resource and being a valley and being a branch, a tree branch to this tree of life for other black women and black men that are trying to get into tech. Um, I can honestly say, um, you know, one of my older brothers um, on my mom's side, he's an engineer. I have cousins that are engineers, you know, computer, um, environmental. So I've seen that side. Now, did I have a direct mentor related to that? No. Did I have access to a village that could help with that? Yes. So I think accessibility is really important. And I feel like as leaders, right now is very, very important that we are mindful of the conversations that we're having. We're mindful of the content that we're sharing. And we're mindful of the resources and being that tree branch for others. 
And the reason that I say that is because it starts with us. There are some people who might not have had somebody to open the door for them. And maybe that might be myself. And, you know, I know it's Kim's, you know, Kimberly Brown from Black Girls School. I know that's her mission. I know it's Angela Benton's mission. Like there's a whole lot of women in tech, Jules Burke Solomon. I know it's Jules' mission as well. So I know there's a whole lot of opportunity for that. But if we're not having those conversations as leaders, because people are looking to us, it starts with us. So if we could be the door and the bridge to these opportunities for the next generation, because it's important to do so, that is the way we have to walk the walk and we have to talk the talk. And, you know, I think that just looking at people before me, I wish that there would have been a lot more black women in tech that I knew. Um, there were a lot more engineers, but they were in different, you know, niches in engineering and not really what I was looking to do. But I think if there were a lot more opportunities, I'm not going to say I probably would have been as far as I am now, but I think I would have had a lot more headway and I really would have had a lot more understanding. And that's okay because I don't take the journey that I have for granted and the way that I came into this space. But I'm challenging, you know, all of the black women in tech, the black men in tech that I know. I'm challenging us to be leaders right now and to really speak and to figure out ways collectively, individually, that we could be those tree branches for people that are coming up behind us because they're watching us right now. You know, you got kids in college watching us right now. You have, you know, people watching us internationally. You have companies watching us. And it's important to make sure, like we said, at the end of the day, to really focus on the opportunities that we have and how we can really, you know, do great things for the generation coming behind us. But it really innately starts with us. Like we have to be visible as leaders. We have to speak, we have to share educational resources. We have to provide training. Like it really starts with us at the end of the day. Mm, that's powerful. And as a black woman that's in this tech space, what obstacles do you face at the workplace? Sometimes being the only black woman and sometimes probably the only woman in your mm -hmm. space sometimes. So what are, you know, some of those challenges sometimes? Um, I can honestly say I was blessed to not have as many experiences as that when I was working for in corporate America. I can be honest to say that. But the two that are definitive that stick in my mind, um, I used to work for a state government agency um, when I first moved um, back to Atlanta. Because I was here in 2010. I left for like a few months to go help take care of my dad before he passed. And I came right back. Like I literally told him, like, look, this is a short time in a mission. I'm coming back to Atlanta. But for the most part, I remember working for a state government agency, the youngest black female on my team. I was actually in grad school at the time at Georgia Tech because um, I have an MBA in management and technology. I remember being excited about learning about new ways for budgeting and new ways to create a better tech budget based on project. I was excited about this moment because it was like an educational epiphany for me just looking at the information that was being provided i remember distinctively talking to a black superior of mine and she's not that much older than me and she told me very blatantly that they're probably not going to want to listen to anything that you have to say and i was like okay let me just try anyway you know just being a millennial let me try <laughs> so i remember going into a meeting it was all the big wigs there, you know, um, commissioner and, you know, assistant commissioner, deputy, all that stuff, all the supervisors. And like, I remember trying to raise my hand and make a suggestion. And I remember my supervisor, supervisors kind of like tapped me and was like, Shh, no. And I was like, but like, they need to see these projections. Like, I'm like, this actually could help them with cost saving. Like I'm going into this dissertation. And she was just like, just no. So went back and had a meeting with my boss directly. And I was like, why wouldn't she let me talk? She was like, well, she's kind of afraid of her positioning because, you know, she's the only black supervisor. And if somebody on her team speaks out, it might not be a good look for her. I was like, okay, duly noted. So that was my first opportunity. The second came from um, a private educational institution here in Atlanta. And I remember feeling like I, it was a few black people on the team but I remember like my boss directly, white Caucasian, you know, male, you know, he was a little bit older than me. It was always an issue when I asked the question. Mm -hmm. And when I ask questions, it's usually because I feel like you're not clear enough and I have clarity about what you're corresponding and communicating with me. So I remember we're in a meeting, CTO, like everybody is there. 
And I asked a question. So then he was like, well, I'll get back to you that, you know, after the meeting, we can discuss that. So I'm thinking everything's cool. So after the meeting, we get to the meeting and he was just like, yeah, I just want to let you know, like, please don't ever embarrass me like that again. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I asked you a question. And I knew from that moment. And then I had a conversation with a black male colleague of mine at lunch that same day. He was like, don't trust him. He was like, he always tries to put people in situations and he tries to make himself look good in front of the CTO. So if you try to ask questions, don't do it. I was like, so why are y'all still here? And why would you actually, you know, want to deal with somebody like this? Like this company, this school recruited me. Like I was at the state. I got recruited because of my you know my resume and my background and just from networking like i got recruited to come there like i didn't apply and like like y'all were looking y'all were checking for me so having wow. that being said you know how is it that i can't speak and i can't ask a question if i'm not clear on something so i knew that day from my black colleague who i'm still cool with to this day and we we laugh about stuff now because it's just like this is like it was crazy to experience it back then but i'm grateful it happened because it, it told me how to handle people, especially yeah. being a black woman in tech and being young. Um, but in those instances, I still spoke because at the end of the day, I don't feel like I'm going to allow anybody to take away my voice. Um, yeah. And that's number one. Number two, yeah. I'm going to ask a question if I'm not clear on something. And obviously, you weren't making this stuff clear in the first place. That's why I asked the damn question. <laughs> um, and number three, it told me in that moment how being powerful and giving off an aura of energy that I am one and that I'm an educated black woman in tech, mm -hmm. that that is fearful to some people because you don't know how to approach it or you don't know what my response is going to be. And I remember with this black colleague of mine, um, he always used to be like, yeah, you different. They, they will always try to target you because you different. I was like, why? He's like, cause you intelligent and you're not backing down. I was like, well, I'm not supposed to. And the other black, you know, female colleagues were always very timid didn't ask questions. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't roll like that at all. Like, I wish I would be timid. My, both of my parents would be like, what, what, the, what the hell is this? Like, what, yeah. what are you doing? Like, you know, so those two experiences were very defining for me. Like I said, it taught me a lot about the tech space. Um, and it also told me a lot about being a black woman in tech. So I learned a lot from those moments. And I'm like I said, I'm grateful that those were the only two that I've yeah. had. Um, and I know people that have way worse especially what's going on now like i know people that work for tech companies and they are treating them right now like they have no regard for what's going on and i was like that is definitely not the tone that you need to set but i've i've known friends and acquaintances that have are experienced that and it's real and i'm like i don't miss them goddamn days at all like i'm just like i don't miss those days at all but yeah like those are the only two instances i stayed strong you know i didn't let it def me i didn't allow people to define my narrative or mm -hmm. what stuff was but i realized in that moment that i was i was powerful and that that was very you know appealing and yeah. seemed to be very overbearing for a lot of people wow i feel that and speaking on tech companies and fortune 500 companies that's not speaking up during this time how do you feel about that when sometimes <laughs> we make these things go yeah and now they aren't even there for us how do you feel about that so I, uh, my mom is a retired teacher, so I had to educate her on some terminology, some slang lately. <laughs> so she said, one of my cousins had told her, you know, Chris is asking for a lot. I said, yeah, I told her right now, I want all the smoke. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here for all of it. And, and this is the reason why in all transparency. For me being a black woman in tech, and especially being a technologist, um, which is a person who is very well versed in areas, different areas of technology, I talk about systems and tools all the time. And these companies that I've been calling out are companies that I have used, I have told clients to use, and I've also shared that with my community. It is so unethical in my personal professional pr opinion to keep representing and keep sharing about these companies and what they can do if they don't honor the hell that I'm a black person. Right. Yet alone a black woman. So to me, I'm I'm very not pleased with a lot of companies. I've been very vocal about that. I, like I said, I want all the smoke. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I've called companies out. I've sent emails. I've sent DMs because I'm like, some of these companies I do have relationships with. So like ConvertKit, Nathan Barry, the CEO, when they first dropped their little tidbit, I was like, yeah, dog, this not it. Like, <laughs> like this ain't going to work. We got to do better. And that started conversation with him 
and also his COO Barrett. And I was just like, yeah, we need to fix that. And same with Podia, um, you know, with Lynn Markinson, um, you know, I, I told him straight out in the meeting, I was like, yeah, so this, this wasn't a good look. Like we need to work on some stuff. And I got a chance to talk to Becca, the CEO and co-founder of Dusado and her head of community HR biz. And I told them the same thing. Like I am very unauthentic about a few things when I meet with a brand, I'm black. I'm a black woman and I'm a black woman in tech and I probably am going to curse, but me and Jesus have a good relationship. So as long <laughs> as y'all know those things, mm. we're good. Yeah. But I always try to make sure that that information is conveyed and that that is very clear from the jump, because if there is any issue with my blackness and with my being unapologetically black, we can't do business. It's that simple. I'm not going to sit up here. You're not going to woo me. You're not going to pursue me. You're not going to do none of those things because I'm not going to listen to what the hell you have to say. Mm -hmm. But for me right now, there are still a lot of companies that I feel like now now it's no longer about me calling you out. Now it's about your unwillingness to really understand your black creators, your black customers, and your black audience. Because if you look at the, the financials of all these companies right now, and if we had somebody in the data science department and analytics department break down the percentage of black consumers to any other race, hands down, that probably will be the majority of the market share of their company. And so when you break it down like that, if we took an authentic stand and said, you know what, you don't support our black lives, we're not going to support your goddamn business. We're going to take our shit. We're going to move it to another one. And that's what that's going to be. If we can start really looking at the economical power of that structure yeah. and really yeah. start depleting not only these companies, but saying, hey, blacks in tech, black engineers, black software developers, go build this. We want we want a black owned one. Can y'all go do it? Like a great um, acquaintance of mine, Rohan, God, um, what is it? Giles, yes, Giles or Gikes. I forgot how to pronounce his last name. Rohan, I'm sorry, because I know you're going to see this. He already has created and is starting to process the next Gumroad. You know, I've called Gumroad out because, you know, Salil is just the CEO, man. He just, he got too emotional. And sometimes you got to remember business is business. You can't be mm -hmm. so emotionally invested. And, but these mm -hmm. tech companies I'm calling out, like there's still, you know, quite a few on my hit list you know if you listen to you know clout and you listen to cardi b long line she said it's a whole lot of like I, a whole lot of people still on my hit list like it is it's not a hit list it's more so just like you're going to know that i'm going to be very vocal and visible and at any time i see any black person and black member of my audience talking about your product i'm going to politely correct them and say hey you might want to do your homework on said product because they don't care about your black lives now the companies who have retracted statements got it right i salute them but i'm still holding them accountable too and i told all these companies that i've had these meetings with all their c-level people that i've talked to hey i'm gonna be checking the hell up on y'all so like please know like with, with action comes accountability so i'm still going to have conversations with you we're still going to be talking about what you said you were going to do and i'm going to check and see if you have done what you said you were going to do it's that simple. It's an accountability thing. And I had, you know, two women, two black women on some of my posts the other day have a lot of different conversations with me about, you know, me, especially with two particular companies, one with Sam Cart and one with Canva. And on the Canva post, basically, the young lady was just explaining to me that, you know, um, you got to look and see what they've done and like look and see how they've added things to their media library and she's deleted this comment you know since that time but honey i screenshot anything i'm gonna tell you <laughs> um and you know i sent her a response so she was just like we we need to stop looking at the people who um from the perspective of just put a post up for no good and look at the companies actually doing stuff and i'm i'm open to everybody's opinion and feedback right. i'll respond when i feel needed so i did respond to her and i explained to her i need you to look a little bit deeper into my contextual information that i'm providing you they did not provide a statement they provided a social media post with bullet points. And that is different from a statement. To me, in my personal professional opinion, a statement is basically, I can find it on your blog, your website, all of your other social media avenues. Yeah. Canva had one statement um, that was on Twitter, but it sent them everybody to the same post that was on Instagram. It was a Blackout Tuesday post. Okay. And I'm very familiar with Canva's makeup on their team. There is not one black person on their team. So there's also a diversity issue. And when you think about it and think about the contextual level, how can you have conversations about black issues when there's nobody black on your team? What people are you bringing in to train you 
What HR professionals, what will you do to help them train you and have those conversations? And then additionally, you said that you're going to continually work with, you know, you want designers and creators to add more content to your library. Because I'm a consumer and I explain this too. I've seen the updates, but not just about getting the designers and creators to add to your library. How are you going to empower their stories? How are you going to tell them? You can't really tell their stories because you're not black. You need somebody black to tell their stories. So how about working with like a Melissa Kimball from Black Creatives, who I'm very connected with, and Melissa is amazing. She has a research or network. Or like my friend Rochelle Lynn, who is a content strategist who works with companies and clients that helps them with their messaging, you know? Or like even with, um, you know, other people, like jobbing with Jazz. Jazz is an amazing woman. She's an HR consultant. I've literally plugged her to these companies like, hey, y'all HR listings, y'all job listings are trash. You need to have the messaging be right if you're looking to add more Blacks in your pipeline. But that's what I'm talking about. Like I was explaining that for the Canva. And then with the Sam card, I was like, it was a PR stunt. It basically was more so, hey, let's put something out. Basically, we need that. And I got a meeting with them tomorrow. And shout oh, out wow. to the six figure chick, CC for the assist, because, you know, what people don't understand and tech companies need to be, I need to say this very loud and clear. Most of your creators are friends or acquaintances. They know each other. They have conversations about your platforms. They have conversations about if they're going to do stuff. So we need to really focus on a collective and really looking at the buying power and really looking and understanding about the messaging power. Because like all the companies, I've told all of them individually, messaging right now is super important. It is huge. Right. But if you're not addressing the issue at hand, how can we trust you with our income and how can we trust you with our business? You know, at the end of the day, we're utilizing your tools for our business. So I've, I've been very unapologetic about calling people out. I've been very unapologetic about, you know, updating people. And I also had somebody else and, you know, I'm not, I'm not using this as a shady moment, but I just need to address this person that said this comment to her friend in my post. Um, you know, I appreciate everybody that is utilizing their platforms to signify, you know, tech companies. And she made a statement to the effect that it was more so a hot trend and everybody is doing it. I applaud that if people are. Um, I, I, I use my platform basically just to keep people in the know. Um, you know, I make sure that I can help to contribute to other people's platforms if they are soliciting information. You know, um, a great woman by the name of Sherelle Dorsey from TPI Insights, there's a story link. It might still be in my Instagram stories. If not, I'll add it later. She um, and her team created a data spreadsheet of all the companies that have spoken up. I have shared that because she created it. So that is another way to utilize my platform to keep people in the know. I've just done stuff on my personal platform, really just talking about who has spoken up and like i understand where the woman was coming from i get that and she's right like if companies weren't listening to her or if they you know weren't like i i agree with her point in her statement and stuff like that but let's let's not use that as a as a moment because i'm not putting myself on a pedestal i this I, none of this i'm doing right now is is about me it's really about us there's a yeah. difference i don't give a damn about me right now it's about my audience and in my it's about my community if they good if these companies are good then that's fine but like I read the comments, I don't always respond to everything because I'm not required to. <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, and I don't owe anybody a goddamn thing. But mm -hmm. I I do respond when I need to. But I, I I you know I definitely wanted to like share that with the young woman. Like if she you know which I plan to re like reach out to her today, which was on my agenda. Say like, hey, what companies are not listening to you? Like, let me help. Or what can I do to make sure that they don't overlook you again? Like that's right. where I am. I'm not right. taking this as a me moment. But I think that we need to come a little collective and just not make it about us. Cause I'm damn sure not making it about me right now. Like I could really care less. Like Rochelle, my friend will tell you, and she put it on her Instagram story. I was very humble about any of these meetings that I was, what I was having last week. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just had them. I updated the statements. I updated it on my platform because it wasn't about me. I, I don't get nothing from this. The only thing I did was just make sure that my community is aware. And I want to make sure the black community is aware as well. But you know, overall, I'm not satisfied still with a lot of tech companies, I um, but, I, but I'm taking their silence as a response, and I'm letting my audience and my community know that you got to pivot accordingly. There are a lot of companies that have not spoken out that have a huge Black creator and Black consumer space, and, you know, you have to make the personal decision to determine what's going to be best for you and your business. If you want to move your tools, move them. I salute you if you do that. If you don't, that's your opinion too. And like, I'm not knocking that. I'm not going to be one of those people that's going to judge you like that. 
I'm going to be basically just giving you the information and you do what you choose with it. For me, I'm moving all my shit off of a lot of platforms over the next few days. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you what to do. I can just give you the information. But we still have a long ways to go because it's not just about responding to Black Lives Matter. It's about also diversity on your team. It's about educating your team. It's about these funds and these causes that you're donating to. Like, where to check? Cut it. Like, you know, most of the tech like SaaS owners and the tech companies, all of them are cool or friends. So I know y'all have conversations with mm. one another about this stuff. I know some of y'all have been trying to fish for conversations or try to make sure from a PR perspective, everything is good. And like I've told all the companies, I challenge you all not to go back to business as usual. That is going yeah. to look very, very skeptical. And I'm paying yeah. attention. And I told them, I was like, I have no problem. Please be clear, calling none of y'all asses out again. I don't. Um, but I think that there is a long way to go with these tech companies. And, you know, there's only the work has just begun. And I know that sounds crazy because there's a lot of people like, yes, this company is spoke. That's great. There's still a ton that have not. Um, I am usually an optimistic person, but I do feel like at the same time, from a realistic, realistic perspective, if people have not already spoken, their silence has spoken for them. So we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do. That's facts. That's powerful. Uh, Kiana Thomas had a great point. And that's actually my next question. We need mm -hmm. alternatives. And speaking, you know, on that same point, um, mm -hmm. I think since the beginning of time, we know that we as a people, we've always been genius when it comes to creating things, yes. being innovative, everything. And I feel like yes. sometimes that gets exploited because we as mm -hmm. creatives work for these big companies and they get all mm -hmm. of our creative juices and we don't own anything. So then mm -hmm. when stuff like this happens, and we're asking for these alternatives for our own platforms. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's nowhere to be found. So do you feel like as a person and a black woman in tech that we're doing a good enough job for creating our own thing? Um, I think we're on the way to doing so. And I, I'm going to be very honest about that. Okay. The technologies, um, some are not as easy as people see, as they see them. If you are not a technologist or if you're not a programmer or if you're not a developer some of the technology is, are not as easy as you think there are a lot of layers and complexities to it some on the other hand are very seamless i think that going forward now the black in tech black engineers black developers there is a a hunger right now to create something culturally for the community and to create our own i feel like in the next from a technology forecasting perspective, in the next like six to nine months, there will definitely be some solutions to some of these problems with some of these companies. Um, yeah. But what I need to make very, very clear. We got to make sure we have our shit together too. So it's not just about creating the product. It's about making sure our customer service is going to be together. It's making sure that our marketing and our messaging is going to be together. It's, it's to make sure that everything on the back end and infrastructure looks just as pretty as what people see on the front. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of leeway right now for it. Um, I'm excited to see what black creators and black engineers and black programmers create right now. There's so many opportunities. Like, I'm telling you, there's so many opportunities. And I think that if on some of the ones we can have some power collective come together to build one, I think that would be great. What I'm starting to see is that there are a lot of individual projects and that's all well and good. But I, I definitely need to make sure that we are focusing on the overall goal and vision which is to make sure that we're working together collectively to provide these tools. There is a huge opportunity in the sales funnel builder space. There's a huge opportunity in some of the email marketing spaces. There's a huge opportunity in digital product download. Like there's so many opportunities. Yeah. And if we can focus on those markets first and really come together and work together as teams and really focus on it from that perspective, I really believe that there will be a lot of great things. So like in six to nine months, definitely. I definitely think that. And yes, collaboration over competition because, you know, I feel like sometimes, and, and I'm going to just say the stuff that people don't like to say because that's just the type of person that I am. Um, 
a lot of times, especially right now, I can definitely see some indications and signs of people that are trying to go for self with creating these platforms. And it's not going to do us a service. It's going to do us a disservice if we're not really collaborating on stuff. I, um, you know, just talking to some friends and acquaintances of mine, we've run some ideas and I'm just like, yeah, but it's not just been me. It's been mm -hmm. us having yes. a conversation, talking about how we're going to lay this out, talking about how we're going to do this, that, and the third. And I think that is important, especially right now that we come together and it not be a selfish moment, but it be a selfless moment and that we focus on the collaboration and not the competition. So I said, give it like six to nine months. I think that there will be some platforms. Some could be up sooner. Um, I, I know from what I see, and I know just from conversations, I know that there are a lot of great things coming. Um, but like I said, I, I just need us to focus on the, com the collaboration part, not the competition part, and being selfless um, in that process. That's needed. That's awesome. And I think somebody asked a question, uh, good hair, good body asks, do you know any Black-owned tech companies that need collective global Black community financial investment? So, no, I know some um, black VCs. Um, so there are not any right now that I know that need investment. What I, what I would challenge you to do, um, I would get very interactive, like I said, in black tech Twitter, um, the hashtag on Twitter. Um, there are a lot of black creators, technologists, engineers, programmers, developers over there. I would have those conversations over there because you'll be able to collect, connect with rather a lot more people that are looking to create stuff. Um, you know, I am fortunate to know, like, you know, the Collab Capital Group, that's basically, you know, Justin Dawkins, Dream Maven, um, and Jules Burke Solomon. I feel like I'm missing somebody. So guys, if y'all watching this, I apologize. <laughs> um, but they're Collab, Collab Capital, like that's a black owned investment group for blacks and blacks in tech specifically. Um, you know, they're, they're amazing. And, you know, I, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet with Jewel personally about something. Jewel's amazing. Um, Justin, I've, I've been able to connect with him. Um, and like what they're doing, the work that they're doing is really, really amazing. Um, I think that there is going to be a sincere increase in Black VCs going forward too. I can see that coming. Um, that are going to be investing into um, Blacks in tech. I see that coming just because there's going to be an opportunity for a lot of new software as a service platforms and products but I don't know of anybody, but like I said, I would challenge you to get on Twitter um, and actually be really inactive. Follow the hashtag Black Tech Twitter. You probably will find a lot of people that could possibly utilize your services and your capital. Got you. That's awesome. And something on your page that I loved as well was talking about staying in touch with your clientele, your audience, mm -hmm. followers. Uh, you spoke about Superphone, uh, mm -hmm. building that email list, the texting mm -hmm. list. So how important is it to build that type of infrastructure where you can always be in touch. How important is that? Yeah, yeah it's real important right now. Um, yeah. You know, as soon as things like happen with George Floyd and like Breonna Taylor, I was very authentic to my audience. Um, to my email list, I sent them out just saying, hey, give yourself grace. Allow yourself to feel what you want to feel right now. Like you are, you're not, you don't have to have a response if you don't want to, and that's not how you operate, but give yourself grace to be okay with how you're feeling right now. Um, and then I also sent like a follow-up communication, just basically letting them know like, Hey, um, if you have a problem with me talking about being black, then the unsubscribe Baptist church Mount Holly on the rock is open and you are free to leave. I'm totally unapologetic. That means that you don't need to be on my list on my mobile list, I literally had quite a few people that says, please unsubscribe, please stop sending me messages. Like I had that. And I was like, okay. Like, I mean, like that message wasn't supposed to be here anyway. I'm totally okay wow. with that. But you gotta be honest with your audience. You have to show up right now because they are taking your silence as you not speaking. Y'all laughing, I'm so serious. If there's anybody like that's watching this live right now, Ashley, I know like one of my clients is in here. She will tell you, I literally like people on my list. I literally said, you are more than welcome. The doors of the church of unsubscribed Baptist church are open. You are free to leave. And you got to really empower your audience. But I think that 
they're looking to you as leaders, as experts, as, you know, think about it, like your fans, your audience, they, I'm not going to use the word idolize, but like they stand for you. Yeah. So they are looking for you to stand for them and mm. being communicative, keeping them in the loop, letting them know what's going on. Like I sent that email I was like, Hey, I'm moving all my stuff from various platforms. Give me grace during this process, but I will keep you in the loop when everything is done. Like you got to just be authentic. And it's important to use all of the different mediums and channels. Like if text marketing is going to work for you use that communicate if your email list is going to work use that and communicate and the reason why i've been such a huge advocate of that is that we got to start pushing people to content that we own we don't own social media at any time mark zuckerberg if y'all really knew how powerful this dude was and how many companies facebook owns like facebook owns what whatsapp they own Instagram. They just purchased Giphy in a stupid deal. Like yeah. they own yeah. a lot of platforms. Yeah. So yeah. at any given time, they can come and shut your account down without notice. They can say it's a terms of service issue. That's why I always tell my audience, read everything in the fine print. But at the end of the day, they can just come and shut your stuff down. Yeah. You know, same with Twitter. Jack, CEO, they can shut your stuff down too. So... I like to push people to content to my own that I own because I can control that narrative. I can control that relationship with my audience. And, you know, for me, text marketing just seems to be working a lot better. Um, you know, mobile is just on the rise. And, you know, what Ryan Leslie and the team have as Superphone um, is amazing. Um, and, you know, I just think it's a better way to navigate and, you know, just wait for me to reach my audience. And like, like I said, everything is not going to work for everybody. Maybe for you, your email list might be banging and that might be what it is, but still communicate. You still own all of those email addresses. You still own all of your contacts. You're just utilizing a platform to supply the contacts and the content virtually to your contacts. So you still own all that stuff, but push people to content that you own. I think all of that is important. And it's just, it, it blows my mind how much people are dependent on social media. I always tell people, and this is just something that, Ryan, um, you know, said in an interview when he was talking about Superfall, he was like, leverage social media, don't rely on it. And I totally agree. That's powerful. I think someone asked a pretty good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, on a local level, should we provide recommendations on collaborating to ensure we capture this Black energy? Yes, I would highly recommend yeah. so. So, like, prime example, um, I'm in the Atlanta area, um, as I've stated before. Um, I'm a member of the Gathering Spot. Um, I have not been going out just because on a back thing for me, um, I lost two, two family members to COVID, like in a two-week mm. span. So I am taking the social distancing part very, very seriously. Yeah. But there are ways to connect on a local level. Um, I would recommend checking meetup.com. I would recommend, you know, looking at your local chambers of commerces because most of them are doing virtual stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I would look at, you know, Facebook groups because there are a lot of Facebook groups on a local level that might be local to where you are that have organizations like that. Um, I also, too, and I know this is going to sound the most vulnerable about what I'm about to say, but put yourself out there, too. If you know Hutch210, and what's your real name? Because I don't like to call people by their username, and I would love to <laughs> personally. So if you can tell me your real name so I can respond to this properly, um, reach out and let people know on social media that you have an interest in collaborating on the project. If mm -hmm. nobody knows that you have an interest to connect and collaborate, how can you expect to connect and collaborate? That's like I tell clients right. all the time, Herman, nice to meet you. Um, I tell people all the time, like especially my clients, I'm like, you sitting up here complaining to me about your email list, but have you told folks you got one? Like, you know, you can't be upset <laughs> with yeah. the message that you're getting at that. So Herman, like I would look at your local city, you know, where you're located, look at the Chamber of Commerce, look at, you know, Black Chamber of Commerce, if that's a different thing. If you have credentials, like I would look at the Black MBA Association. I would also look mm -hmm. at, you know, organizations and foundations that are focused on helping um, you know, black business owners or black entrepreneurs come together collectively. I would look at, you know, media outlets to see if black enterprise are doing like any virtual events or things of that nature. I would also look if you're in a fraternity or sorority, look at regional opportunities for your fraternity or your sorority. If you are uh, in a fraternal order or in, um, you know, a Mason or your order of the Eastern Star, I would look at those organizations as well. I would also look at um, culture ones too, like if you are Jamaican, if you are Bahamian, see what your consulate is doing and stuff too, because right now, 
everybody is trying to focus connectively on their their tribes and their audience but on a local level i would definitely just like also put yourself out there say hey i'm interested in connecting with somebody to help me create eight fill in the blank um who will be interested in meeting up getting on you know a video call or, or starting in a slack group those are the ways that you can put yourself out there um to be very very transparent and that would be a great way to recommend um if you could let me know herman like where you're located i might be able to provide you with a little bit more specifics or resources um just because i have a lot of people spread out um but that would probably be my response to that question that's awesome and chris as well when it comes to entrepreneurship being in the tech space as well how do people monetize their skill sets or how should we monetize um, our skill sets and also how do we build up that client list as well um i think that's huge so he said he's in dallas so definitely check the dallas chamber of commerce um because i just saw your response there the black dallas that's huge dallas awesome. is a huge space for collaboration um i feel like i have somebody in dallas if you can message me um, I'll, I'll look in my contacts, but I feel like I have somebody in Dallas. Networking but, um, in real time. <laughs> yeah, perfect. yeah. I'm just like, yeah, I'm sitting yeah. up here thinking like I'm going through yeah. my head. Um, <laughs> you know, can you re-ask your question too? Because like he got me sidetracked because I was really trying to sit up here and think about the Dallas thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was trying to answer your question in mid thought, sure, but I was like, oh no, I see that. Yeah. Restate your question that for me. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So um, again, when it comes to entrepreneurship and also being involved in that tech space, mm -hmm. how does you, or how do we monetize our skill sets? And as well, how do you build up that client list as well? Okay. So for how do you monetize, I, I honestly recommend working with somebody. And I, I am a big proponent of coaches. I am a big proponent of, you know, group scenarios because I feel like for if you can't learn it on your own, it's very important to invest in yourself to somebody that has always learned it and has already been successful at it. Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah. I can announce this today because I've been talking about this a little bit low key. I am getting ready to start taking on um, Black in Tech service providers as coaching clients as far as like group coaching. Um, I feel like the way that I've been branding myself, I've been messaging myself, I've been monetizing a lot of Blacks in Tech that provide a service, whether you are a um, business operational strategist, whether you're a sales funnel strategist, whether you're an email marketing strategist, whether you're tech support. I feel like that there is a huge lack and I haven't really seen a Black in Tech coach for Black in Tech service providers. And I feel like the investment piece is a really big part to monetize because for me, I've, you know, I've been in the tech space for 10 years, but I've been an entrepreneur for six. I know what strategies work well for Blacks in tech. Why? Because I am Black in tech. So I understand yeah. about the level of clientele. I understand about the quality of clients. I understand how to get clients and how to do lead generation. Why? Because I invested into coaching and have for almost about the last four or five years since I've been an entrepreneur, mind you, I said I've been one for six. I've invested that money and that time into that. So I know for a fact, like I can work with black and tech service providers. Like I have quite a few as clients and we go through messaging, we go through branding, we go through how to get clients, we go through how to set up packaging. You know, we, we have those conversations because I've already done it. Um, and I think just now there seems to be a heightened ability when it comes to blacks in tech, especially service providers, branding themselves appropriately, because I'll be honest to say that first year of business, I was very behind the scenes. I wasn't really sharing stuff. And what happened? My business was not as successful. It's not until I came out in the limelight, I started putting myself out there. I started sharing my story. I started talking about content. I started changing my messaging. I started making sure I had the right packaging, make sure I had everything to leverage the opportunities that were in front of me. But that came from an investment. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people be like, oh, well, I can do it myself. That's great. Let me know how that works out for you. But at the end of the day, it's important to invest with yourself. I still now, you know, I still have a coach. I still, you know, spend money towards personal development and professional wow. development because I got to keep refining my skills. I can't be lackadaisical in things that I'm doing. And technology changes every second. So I got to stay in the loop. 
I got to find out. So, like, I'm always reading. I'm always studying. And the reason why, to be very transparent, I built a lot of relationships with this company. And I'm telling you all this straight facts. This is no fluff. I want to know what the hell that they were doing and how they were updating this shit so fast. And then I wanted to know how I could share that information with my audience to keep them in the loop. Why do you think, you know, and I say this for people who know me, why do you think I always know stuff quick? Because I built relationships with these tech companies. And I'm like, yeah. I definitely want to know what y'all going on. Let me get a certification in your stuff. Let me be one of your evangelists so that you'll build a relationship with me. And one case study of that I can say is Jason Freed of Basecamp. Um, Jason, and he's a co-founder in DHH. Shout out to y'all. They're not on Instagram, but um, Jason and I have built a great relationship over about a three-year span. I was very intentional about it because I have used Basecamp from the jump. And as soon as I met with him and got a meeting, I found out his wife was from Baltimore. I was like, oh, I'm in there. Like, we got a connection <laughs> now that I know that. Yeah. And I've been very vocal. I've shared their product. I've done that. This is even before I had got a relationship with him. I was able to, you know, connect with them when they do stuff. I talk to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, and like, even when this all went down, like I had a conversation with Jason too. So, you know, there's a trust that I built with these tech companies and it's important for monetizing skills because you got to know the platforms that you're teaching about but i've been able to brand myself so well like that and this wasn't overnight y'all like i've been an entrepreneur for six years this did not happen overnight i i have failed i have fucked up i have done a lot of crazy stuff this did not happen overnight but i was very intentional about these relationships with these tech companies so i could always be in the loop so when people found stuff out like, yeah, the black techie said it first. She mm. said this first. She told me about said platform. Most of y'all favorite influencers, I am their favorite techie. Why? Wow. Because I know most of the stuff and I know most of the platforms they're using. And they usually come to me anyway and ask me questions. Guarantee wow. it. Guarantee wow. it. But monetization is about investing in your scale self. Building, you know, like you said, your email list and your audience and just that is a long process. And it is continual. And I, I was just talking to a client today. You know, she is getting in the um, the hair space. And you're right. I do, Erica. Hey, Erica. <laughs> um, end of the day, you know, was telling her, you know, she's like, well, I was talking to my coach and blah, blah, and things of that nature. And, like, I was trying to figure out blah, blah. I was like, so let's pause all this. Because you technically are still in pre-launch phase. I said, how are you going to launch to somebody if you haven't built a relationship with somebody wow. like you can't that just doesn't make sense to me that's like right. if you like if we weren't like interacting and if you didn't reach out to say you wanted to interview me for this right and how could you know you come later on down the line if there was no conversation or no communication about how that that doesn't work like that now yeah. this is a start for a relationship for us yeah. right yeah. but like i told her it's the same way with your business how are you preparing for a launch if you haven't built an audience and you don't have nobody to launch to? Exactly. So now that that now that, that I have woman went off for her today and she yeah. was like, it makes sense. So build your audience from the start, even when you don't have a product, yeah. even when you are still formulating your tech service or your tech product, or hell, regardless of what industry you're in, build your audience. Tell people you have an email list. Tell people you have a text list. What do you talk about? Well, you talk about what you know. So I can talk about right now, like if I didn't have a product, here's how I've been calling the hell out of all these tech companies. Here's why I've been doing it. I can give the story. I can share the behind the scenes of the information that I've shared with these tech companies because I've told them all. I said, I'm going to tell people the same thing on social media. I'm telling y'all right now. Like the same stuff I said, the same part. We having that same conversation in the meeting. Like I am the same on and offline that does not change. So what could I talk about? I can talk about me sharing that process. How did it feel? What backlash have I had? Have I had anybody try to hack me? And you know, like, I mean, there's a lot. Cause you know, with, you know, great acceptance and stuff comes great responsibility. So That's I could right. talk about that right now and I can build an audience that says, okay, she's our tech resource. She's kind of like our tech ESPN. She's going <laughs> to give us updates. She's yeah. going to provide us tools. She's going to let us know what's good. And that's what it's going to be. But even if I didn't have a product, I would still build and engage my audience like that. So regardless, if you feel like right now watching this, whether you're watching it live or on the replay, if you feel like you don't have nothing to talk about, you do. You can talk about how you feel like what's going on, even if you don't have a product or service. You can talk about your product and service and how it is going to be a resource for the Black community or for your audience even during this time. 
you always have a story to share. It's just be, it's just a matter of figuring out your angle. For me right now, like it seems like I'm a fucking hot commodity because I'm calling out tech companies. And that's cool. But then when I start sharing my story about myself and then the back end about like how I got here, then it's like, well, wow, didn't know all that. I'm like, well, you didn't because you just saw the first few posts I had. We hadn't really talked about my story. We hadn't really shared that information. So I can still build an audience on that alone. And I challenge you all right now that are watching this, build your audience, control your audience. That is an audience that can be a diehard evangelist tribe for you. They're gonna call you out when you're wrong. They're gonna hold you accountable because you said you're gonna hold them accountable. And they're gonna also expect you to keep shit 100 too. So at the end of the day, Building an engaged audience, it starts from even if you don't have a product or a service, or even if you do, but take the time to build that relationship. Take the time to have those conversations. Take the time to focus on that. That is a foundational piece in business. You cannot sell to somebody that does not know you. They need to know you. Once they know you, they like you. Once they like you, they trust you. Once they trust you, they open up their wallet. It is really that simple, but that is really important about how to monetize. You know what I'm saying? Your business and then also how to build an engaged audience. Like those are foundational pieces for real. Wow. Chris, you dropped so many facts. This was such an amazing conversation. I learned so much from you. My very last question. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? What's next for you? Who? All right. So I'm 38, right? So five, I'll be 43. Um, I will still be running business. Um, I probably will have had two major um, SaaS companies, because I, I got an idea now that I got to get out. So I can see myself being a solution to the black community's problem from a tech perspective. I see two opportunities for me. Um, I see me being able to leave a legacy for my nieces and nephews and little cousins because I don't have any kids. Um, I can see myself traveling, um, sharing about the power of tech for good and just how the people can use and message and amplify their voice using tech. I see that happening. I see probably a book or two, um, but most importantly, I see me giving back to the generation coming behind me. I can definitely see me being mentored by like a Kimberly Bryant, and I keep telling her that like she's my mentor in my head, but I'm gonna make that happen. <laughs> yes, um, but I also see in, I also see, you know, in the back end, the generation behind me. Like my mom is a teacher and I have told her for years, I was like, I never want to teach. I don't <laughs> never want to be in a classroom. But now I find myself looking at collegiate professor positions and looking at how I could be a college professor because I'm looking at that next generation and how I can impact them. Um, I went to Hampton for undergrad, so I've been staring at their job boards. Fun fact, I'm not moving. Like, I'm doing all this remotely because I like living in Atlanta. But yeah. I've caught myself looking at um, collegiate professor opportunities. If the opportunity matched up, I could definitely see me teaching. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of what I look like. Like, the tech companies, me empowering people, me still using my voice. Um, and also, my last thing, would I would see myself on a board of a tech company. Um, that is a big goal for me. I'm giving myself seven years to do it. I think I could honestly do it in five. Um, there are going to be a lot of opportunities for Black women in the next five years. Um, and with, um, you know, Serena's husband, with Alex from Reddit, him stepping down to give a Black person a seat. Like, I see other white allies in powerful positions. I can see that happening in a five or 10 year span. Um, I know right now I'm not ready to be on a seat, but what I will do is I will start preparing myself to get ready. That would be conversations that I would have with Kim um, or even Angela Benton. And just like, what do I need to do to get ready in that regard and, you know, create those companies. So that, that would be my vision. And honestly, I might probably dip off of social media too and tell people y'all better follow me on my goddamn email list and on my mobile list. Cause <laughs> I might not be on here. <laughs> my friends, I said, when I turn 40, I might dip off that whole year. And like, so I have to follow my blog or my newsletter to see what I got going on. But um, that's what I see for the next five years. Um, and like I said, in all honesty, a lot of those things that I gave myself five, I kind of see them happening sooner. Um, mm. I am in a very creative space right now. And despite the pandemic, despite what's going on globally, I feel more inspired and empowered more than ever um, yeah. to share my story 
and to really talk about it because um, the last thing before I will let this go, I technically wasn't supposed to be here. So I say that because I was in a coma when I was 20 mm. months old. And a lot of people don't know that, but I've recently been sharing that as part of my story. And so, um, you know, for the most part, my mom was very, very transparent and was telling me this as I got older, because I didn't ever really knew the story. Like my dad would talk about it. And you know, my parents divorced at an early age, but they were always still great friends, even until my dad passed, like my mom and them great friends. But I didn't really know the story until I got older. So 20 months old, had a febrile seizure. And if anybody has known anybody that had a febrile seizure, like you get a high temperature and oh sometimes it can lead into a coma. And for me, it did. My temperature was like 104 or something crazy. And I was in a coma for six days. And they told my family that, like, she's not going to come out of this function. No, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but what I was, what I was saying um, before we got cut off, those is coming back, um, just because I know y'all are adding in. Like I said, I wasn't supposed to be here. Like, physically, I was not supposed to be here. Geronimo, what's good? <laughs> um, so, like I said, um, when I was 20 months old, I had a febrile seizure, like I said, for people who don't know what that is, that it basically is a seizure where you, where a child gets a very high temperature. And like I said, you can either recover from it or sometimes there could be brain damage associated with it. So the family, um, they basically gave my family, the physicians rather, gave us two options. One, she's going to have some sort of like brain damage or functionality issues because it's a high coma and she's 20 months old, mind you, me, 20 months old. Or she's not going to make it. And it's going to be that simple. So I was in a coma for six days. And, you know, my family definitely was by my side, praying with my parents, you know, my church family at the time, like, praying for my family, like everybody was praying for me because they, they were told basically at the end of the day, they really weren't sure. Because at this point, it's six days. It's a child. Like, I'm not a middle-aged adult. I'm not a teenager. Like, I'm 20 months old. So the probability of me actually being able to get over that and to um, get over it well were very slim, numerically speaking, right? Very, very slim. But what happened on the seventh day was I woke up wow. out of the coma as if nothing happened. I basically said hello to my doctor. And I did not understand at the time why everybody around me was in tears. So for me, when I found that out a little bit later on in life, like I said, I was not supposed to be here because of that coma. And because there was a very well, prob I mean, talking about the odds, like astronomical, like there is no way I should have actually come out of that coma at 21 years old. Like not only come out, but be functional, can talk, can walk graduated high school, graduated college, graduated from my MBA program, actually living past a certain age, like with no issues, no issues at all. So I am technically like a walking miracle. So I mm. take my assignment very seriously. So if people see and understand why I'm going so hard, it's because I was not supposed to be here. My destiny could have been totally different. And there would have not been the black techie. I would have not been able to share my story or share my feedback had that happened and had I succumbed to the febrile seizure into that coma. If I had pretty much just gone away, like that would have been cemented and that would have been infamy and nobody would have been able to know what I would have been capable of, how valuable I would have been able to be to society and also the power that I could have contributed later on in life. That would have been, that destiny would have been cut short. And nobody would have been able to know what I was actually really made of. However, that did not happen. And I am here. I am living. I am breathing. I am functional. I have never had any issues since that time. Like I said, I have graduated. All those things. I'm still looking at next degrees because I like school. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I am a walking miracle. So I, I take my assignment very, very seriously. And I take whatever is had for me and my destiny from the creator. I take anything that comes my way and I, I, I run it off until the wheels fall off. Because like I said, technically I was not supposed to be here. So for me, you know, I encourage everybody that is watching this today, please take that leap of faith. 
please have that conversation if you're interested in getting into tech. I am more than available. Like, my DMs are open. As long as y'all come in appropriately, the Baltimore girl won't have to get out of pocket. We good. I can definitely refer you to connections or resources I have. And I will be honest if I don't know, and I will tell you that, and I will tell you, but I will probably still find out for you. Like, mm -hmm. that's how community is supposed to be. That's right. how things are supposed to be. And so, like I said, I'm literally a walking miracle, and I take my assignment very, very seriously. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's important for us to start taking our assignment seriously right now as well. Whatever it is that you were meant and called to do, I think that it's really important to honor this moment and to really take heed to this moment and pay attention to what's everything going on. A lot of people who might have been asleep are now wide awake. Yep. A lot of people who are already wide awake are probably in turbo time. And the people who are on turbo time are probably on their own little galaxy. Everybody is alert and awake right now. So I think it's important for us to honor this moment, to honor our stories and to share our stories because they are powerful. And if anybody tells you that they're not, I am a living witness to that they are. So, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity today. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it. Um, and I was going to say, I'm at the Black Techie on all social. More than likely, I'm sometimes I'm rarely on here. If y'all text the number in my bio, y'all can get on my mobile club because yeah, I'm, sometimes I don't be with the with the social media and stuff, and I, I be over it. <laughs> oh, I feel you. I feel you. And seriously, you dropped so many gems. This is like one of my favorite conversations. I, I love this. Um, this will be posted on YouTube either mm -hmm. probably sometime um, next week or by the end of this week. So I'll make sure that it's up and posted. Thank awesome. you so much again and keep doing what you're doing because it's needed. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate that. So thanks for the opportunity. And I'll make sure that um, I share this as well on my channels as well, like my YouTube and on my IGTV. Awesome. But thank you guys for hanging out with us on a Thursday because um, I know it's almost the end of the week. But I appreciate all the love and support that I've been receiving. Um, thank you all for the great energy. Um, I receive it. I know like a lot of people think at the end of the day, like she probably don't read. I read comments i read text messages and i do have an assistant but i read and i respond like i'm not getting somebody else to respond for me so i thank the black community i thank y'all for your love and your energy i thank y'all for keeping me safe and y'all making sure i'm good so i appreciate this and the opportunity so thank you once again yes and also i'm here in atlanta so i'll make sure to always uh, stay in touch once COVID is, is over with is yes over please so. please let's link up look if you decide yes. to do this on live mention i, I won't be able to I want to be a live guest because, like, if y'all yeah. think I'm animated now, like, I'm the same in person. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. So, yes, thank y'all for definitely reaching out. Like, please make sure y'all follow me on all my mm -hmm. platforms. Um, I have a lot of great things coming. Yeah. If you are interested in getting into tech um, and you're Black in tech, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I definitely recommend following the hashtag getting active on Twitter, Black Tech Twitter. Um, and if anything, I can be a resource to you all. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Love, love. You be safe and thank you again. You have a definitely will. Time. I appreciate it. You have a great rest of your yes. evening. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you all again for watching another edition of our Millennial Masterclass series. Make sure to follow Chris at the Black Techie. Again, support her business, her movement for Black women who want to get involved in the technology space. Black people. Make sure to reach out to Chris. Her DMs are always open. Her email, phone number is all listed on her Instagram. Make sure to support her, show her the love that she needs, the support, everything. We appreciate you all so much for tapping in each and every episode. Make sure again to subscribe to our channel, hit that post notification bell, share this with at least two to three friends, and let us know down in the comments section your favorite part about this conversation. We love you all so much. This is just the beginning. Make sure to follow us as well on Instagram at 3 Millie Pod. We just getting this thing started. We love y'all. See you next episode. Peace.